Hi everybody, this is uh, lecture six and we're looking at a fair number of chapters now from Isaiah 56 to 61 and this of course is uh, the, a new section, it's third, what we call third Isaiah and we're looking at true righteousness, the coming glory of Jerusalem and the role of God's prophets. We will notice that there is in this new section a significant change in tone and vocabulary and theological outlook. Although so much of Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah continues too, of course. Carol Stuhlmuller in the Jerome Biblical Commentary points out that the setting is now more clearly in the Holy Land rather than in Babylon and the mood isn't as hopeful as it was but rather there's a little bit of a feeling of, of struggle and the object of God's promise and salvation narrows from all Israel to those faith, faithful few, those servants of Yahweh who are very much also open to becoming the light of the nations. And the emphasis on the temple and worship and Sabbath and fasting is beginning to, uh, to show us a, a new spirituality emerging. There is strong continuity and that's, that's perhaps more important to see. The uh, Isaiah and uh, second Isaiah are certainly here in 3rd Isaiah. Brevet Childs points out that God reveals himself in both 2nd and 3rd Isaiah by the inbreaking of a new age. A new age which will be very filled with salvation and justice and where his uh, glory will be revealed to all. Further, Similarities, further similarities are the sign of entrance into this new age is the return of Jewish people from the diaspora and the liberty of captives. Secondly, God's promise of salvation includes an outpouring of the Spirit. Thirdly, Zion is exalted now. It's fully restored and fully open to God. And fourthly, the ministry of the servant of 2nd Isaiah, of course, is now extended to the servants of, of, of Yahweh. The servants of Yahweh. Childs also points out that the strong connection between the vision of 3rd Isaiah and that of original Isaiah is strong too. The return of the Messianic Age the restoration of Zion and the worship of all the nations on God's holy mountain and the sinful acts of the wicked are described as, especially in cultic terms, or the sins are especially just dreadful ways of worshipping, um, magical ways of worshipping. We should try to, to think that the person we call third Isaiah, the prophet we call third Isaiah, we should see that the same God who was working in 1st Isaiah and 2nd Isaiah is still very much active in 3rd Isaiah and his world a generation or so later. 3rd Isaiah clearly sees himself as a prophet faithful to the vision, the vision of 1st and 2nd Isaiah. We notice that the whole corpus of Isaiah is being brought into an organic whole through this prophet, with chapter 1 serving as the prologue to the whole book and chapters 65 and 66 as the conclusion. And just as the opening chapter of 2nd Isaiah, Isaiah 40, resonates with chapter 6 from the original Isaiah, so we'll see that chapters 60 to 62 pick up ideas and words from Isaiah chapter 40. There's a lot of references in 3rd Isaiah back to 2nd Isaiah and sometimes to 1st Isaiah. 
So he's got a third eye's eye, an intimate knowledge of his predecessors. And his written work uh, emerges clearly in their, in their theological vision. He's consciously echoing their thoughts, their words, very words. Some famous passages again in this section too. Arise, shine out, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is rising on you, though night still covers the earth and darkness the peoples. From Isaiah chapter 60. The Spirit of the Lord has been given to me, for the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the poor, to bind up hearts that are broken, etc. From Isaiah 61. I'm going to follow uh, Brevard Childs in his division of these chapters into seven small sections. So the first of these is Isaiah 56 verses 1 to 8. Everybody's included, is what he's trying to say. The opening words, Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. Isn't that the vision of 2nd Isaiah? Christopher Zeitz also calls our attention to 1st Isaiah in the opening chapter. Zion will be redeemed by justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. Justice, righteousness. However, the promise of salvation will only come to those who follow God's law, to those who keep the Sabbath, not profaning it, and restrain their hand from doing any evil. Some commentators see the mention of Sabbath observance as, well, coming from a much later time, when Judaism did become stricter, and Jewish leaders emphasizes, emphasize practices such as circumcision and the Sabbath, just to distinguish them, the Jewish people, from the many others in countries nearby and within the Holy Land who weren't Jewish. But third Isaiah might just be saying, it may not come from a later age, it may just be saying that we've got to be faithful to what we know is the law. We then have concerns about eunuchs and foreigners. If we remember the context of chapters 54 and 55, the worship of the Lord on Mount Zion will contain foreigners. <coughs> you cut that out. And if we remember the opening chapter 40 of 2nd Isaiah, it speaks of the ingathering of all God's people, then perhaps this passage is simply saying that God's people will include foreigners and eunuchs. The prophet is telling foreigners and eunuchs, don't worry, you're part of us. The eunuch is not to say to himself, I'm a dried up tree, because they will be remembered in perpetuity. And the foreigner has but to love God's name, observe the Sabbath, and cling to the covenant for him to find total acceptance. And the text adds, Their holocausts and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. That latter phrase, of course, we probably remember from when Jesus is casting out the money changes from the temple. And it's a great phrase, isn't it? Oh, that every parish would be truly a house, of, a house of prayer for all peoples. The second section now is Isaiah 56 verse 9 to 57 verse 13. False leaders and false religion. This has great unity, this particular section. It's been carefully constructed with references to many Isaiah themes. Verses 9 to 12 
decry the leadership of God's people. And the image of a feast is the exact perversion of the feast we've heard about in chapter 55. Come to the waters, you are thirsty. The watchmen are simply not doing their job now. They dream and lie down and love to sleep. They neglect caring for God's people. There's also a possible reference to Isaiah 40, when a watchman figure proclaims God's return to Zion and heralds good tidings, because the watchmen now don't perceive anything. They've got no good tidings to proclaim. Moving into chapter 57, we see the contrast between the fate of the righteous who enter into peace and the fate of the uh, unrighteous, the apostates, whom the wind will carry away. We have a lament over the perilous state the righteous find themselves in where devout men are taken off and no one gives a thought. And we then hear how the children of sorcerers and adulterers and harlots poke fun at the righteous. They, they jeer and make faces and poke out their tongues. They're then condemned for the very sins that the ancient prophets condemned the people of, the, of their day. They're condemned for their ritual orgies and for child sacrifice. So perhaps third Isaiah is saying something like this, that despite God's revelation of new things and a restored Israel, the old order of evil still happens to keep going. In verse 6, the prophet continues his attack, but the focus now is on the adulterous woman image. Worship of God mingles with strong sexual overtones of pouring out offerings on lovers. And Child's comments, the portrayal of Israel's flagrant idolatry against Yahweh is set in direct opposition to the promise of first Isaiah of the true worship of God on Mount Zion, to which the nations flow to learn the Torah. On a mountain high and lofty, you've put a bed. It contrasts so much to what should be there on God's holy mountain. The third section now, Isaiah 57 verses 14 to 21, salvation offered to the humble. We begin this little section with a recall of Isaiah chapter 40. Prepare a way for Yahweh. Clear the way, remove all obstacles from the way of my people. The reason is so that God can give the humble spirit new life and revive the contrite hearts. Salvation is being offered to all those who are humble and contrite of heart so that they can enter into the holy presence of God. We've certainly moved a little bit beyond 2 Isaiah here because salvation isn't just primarily deliverance from exile, and coming back home, salvation lies with all those who are truly faithful to God, who are humble and contrite, and they're identified with a smaller group of people within God's people Israel, whom we know as the servants, the disciples of Yahweh. Next section, section 4, the middle section if you like, is Isaiah 58 verses 1 to 14. Fasting, fasting in God's sight. In this poem, the prophet is called by God to solemnly proclaim the faults of my people, the sins of the house of Jacob. Childs tells us that while at first glance it looks like the summons of the pre-exilic prophets, like Isaiah, first Isaiah, to proclaim a divine word of judgment, in reality, it's a little bit more like God reflecting on what's happening. God reflects, as it were, on the people's piety and even cites their complaint before 
God responds with a rather devastating attack on the way that they're fasting, on their form of fasting. The prophet says that the people are good to seek God day after day and long to know his ways. A lot of their intentions are good, for that's the essence of true prayer, is it not? However, he then points to their doubts and lack of trust, for they find themselves saying, Why should we fast if you never see it? Why do penance if you never notice? And worst of all, there's a major disconnect between their religious practice of fasting and the way they live their lives day by day, especially in the area of justice. Look, God says, you do business on your fast days. You oppress all your workers. You strike the poor man with your fist. And then comes this. Is this not the sort of fast that pleases me? To break unjust fetters. To let the oppressed go free. To share your bread with the hungry. Powerful stuff. The prophet says that fasting is well and good, but it's only pleasing to God when it's accompanied by living justly. How appropriate it is for our church to give us these verses, at least up to from verses 1 to 9a, at the beginning of our Lenten journey on the Friday after Ash Wednesday. Verses 9b to 14 are, a similar, are similar in content, but slightly different. The conditional clause, if you do this then, indicates God's strong desire for our salvation. If you do away with the yoke, the clenched fish, fist and the wicked word, if you give your bread to the hungry, etc., then the promise of salvation is clear your light will rise in the darkness and Yahweh himself will guide you. This beautiful reading occurs on the Saturday after Ash Wednesday. The final two verses move from doing justice and honouring the Sabbath. The Sabbath is never a day for doing one's own thing, but rather it's a holy day, honourable, and it's a delightful day because it's God's day. The fifth section, Isaiah 59, verses 1 to 21. The repentant few within a sinful nation. It's a bit difficult, this chapter. Some, such as the great Dutch commentator Boykin, see parallels with chapter 50 where there are common themes of salvation as separation from God and the people's complaint that God lacks real power anyway. There's similarities of themes there. Others see parallels with chapter 63, saying that they bracket these two chapters, the central chapters in 3rd Isaiah, chapters 60 to 62. And they remind us that all forgiveness, rather, they remind us that the glorious vision these chapters, these central chapters reveal, will only come about when Israel's sin is confessed and forgiven. So, going a little bit through chapter 59, the first eight verses, we have reasons why God is apparently distant from his people. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with iniquity. And this, this is followed by a catalogue of images, including, it's a bit like vipers and spiders, and it ends with, they do not know the way of peace. There is no justice in their paths. The next section, verses 9 to 15a, we move from the first person plural, we move to the first person plural, and commentators see here 
the response of a faithful Israel, those servants of Yahweh. And they respond to the situation that they're in, a sinful nation, and they respond with honesty. They say, justice is far from us. We grope like the blind along a wall. We all growl like bears. We moan like doves. We're all well aware of our sin. We acknowledge our iniquity. So they understand that they're complicit in the sin that's still there. Even though God is still is very active, the land is still sinful. In verse 15b, God responds, Displeased that there is no justice. God will come like the divine warrior of old and save all those in Israel who turn from evil. He will come to Zion as Redeemer and to those in Jacob who turn away from their sins. And then comes the final verse, which is a sort of epilogue which gives, which gives a fuller interpretation of what's happening here. It's all part of being true to God's holy covenant. And my words that I put in your mouth will not depart. Your children and your descendants will be faithful to me and my covenant. The sixth section now is Isaiah chapter 60, a glorious chapter. It's 22 verses. And it's all about Jerusalem, the glorious city. It's a fantastic poem. And the first six verses come from what we read on the Feast of the Epiphany, which we Westerners understand as, of course, God's revelation to the pagans, to the Gentiles, Epiphany. And I think the text is beautiful and brilliant. In the opinion of Christopher Zeitz, the voice that speaks in these central chapters is the heart of 3rd Isaiah. And most commentators would say that chapters 60 to 62 give us not just the essence, but, but his, his extraordinary vision of what God's city truly is meant to be. We also notice that many of the themes of 2nd Isaiah are here. The light and out of darkness, the pilgrimage of the nations, the returnees from the diaspora. In the three opening verses, we hear of divine light as God's glory breaking out upon the city of Jerusalem. So that nations will come to your light and kings to your shining radiance. In verses 4 to 7, we have the return of Zion's children. Lift up your eyes around you and see. They all gather. They're all coming to you. And this is followed by the description of the arrival of, of different nations who bring their riches and they want to adorn the temple of Yahweh. Child's comments. Midian and Ephra are used as symbols of the great traders from the desert. The Sabaeans of she Sheba recall the wealth flowing to King Solomon as the Queen of Sheba visits. The flocks of Kedah and the rams of Naboth are associated with the Arabic tribes who provide animals needed for the proper worship of God. In verses 8 to 16, the litany of gifts continues. The speed of the return resembles the movement of clouds across the sky, of doves coming home. The wealthy ships from Tarshish, Tarshish, probably in Spain, will come and foreigners will rebuild your walls. And the riches of Lebanon, the pine, the fir, the cypresses will adorn the site of my sanctuary. In the final verses, 17 to 22, there's an expansion of this vision into a rather extraordinary vision of our future. In the city of Jerusalem, bronze will be replaced by gold, iron by silver. 
there will be no more violence. Indeed, the very walls will be called salvation and the city gates thanksgiving. We move more and more into a vision of the heavenly Jerusalem. There is no longer need for the light of the sun or the light of the moon because the Lord will be your light forever and your God will be your glory. And then comes the great promise. All your people will be righteous and they will possess the land forever. We see in this the fulfilment of the promise of the righteous offspring of the servants. While the promise of never-ending light fulfills the promise to the servant to be light to the nations. This very eschatological vision, this vision of the end times, if you like, is a, is a vision of the heavenly city, something taken up by St. John in the book of Revelations. And now, good friends, the seventh and the last section, Isaiah 61. There are 11 verses in this chapter, the role of God's servant. This is a famous passage which St. Luke uses to present Jesus to us as the Messiah in that famous passage in the synagogue. And when he opens the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he finds the place where it's written and he reads it. We use this text for the Chrism Mass during Holy Week. We use it also during Advent as key to understanding the role of the Messiah. In the opening three verses, we have the mission of the servant, the prophet, third Isaiah. And he identifies himself with the servant of second Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord has been given me, for he has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the poor, etc., etc., and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Well, that latter one is clearly a reference to the Jubilee year, when we free every servant we have and we restore any property we've brought, we've bought or to the rightful owners. We then hear that strangers will stand and pasture their flocks, and foreigners will work the fields and vineyards, but you will be called the priests of the Lord. The whole nation will be a land of priests, and priests, of course, are the ones who offer hymns of thanksgiving. God's people will enjoy everlasting joy. In verses 8 to 9, we hear that Yahweh speaks, offering those who act justly an everlasting covenant, and their offspring will receive honour among the nations. And as often happens, the final verses in this chapter are a hymn of thanksgiving. And most probably it's the prophet himself singing, because his soul exults in my God, for he's clothed me in garments of salvation and wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. So we've looked at these chapters more than half of 3rd Isaiah, really. Six whole chapters. We've seen how God's salvation is being offered to the righteous, including those who often felt they weren't worthy enough. Eunuchs, foreigners, etc. We then hear how pervasive social injustice is in the land and how contempt for the righteousness is, is rife. God's salvation, however, is still being offered and it's being offered to the humble and contrite of heart and to all those who follow the duties of their religion with a righteous heart. Again, the prophet speaks of the prevalence of injustice, but those who are righteous do confess their guilt and are open to God's salvation. And then we moved into the key chapters, 1661, 
which speak of the coming of the glory of Jerusalem and the role of Yahweh's servants in preparing for this. Thank you.